through to 26. Let's hear the word of God together. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, You have said so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he gave him no answer, not even to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. Now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to release for the crowd any one prisoner whom they wanted. And they had then a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when they had gathered, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you, Barabbas, or Jesus, who is called Christ? For he knew that it was out of envy that they had delivered him up. Besides, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, Have nothing to do with this righteous man, for I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor again said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release to you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, Then what shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? And they all said, Let him be crucified. And he said, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Let him be crucified. So, when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, He took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And all the people answered, His blood be upon us and on our children. And then he released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. So reads the word of God. David's going to come and... Well, thank you, Brian, and it's uh, always good to be with you. Matthew 27, 11 to 26, our subject is conviction or compromise. Conviction or compromise. I've never been asked to do jury service. I'm sure that one or two of you here have done jury service. In fact, I've never, ever set foot in a British court. But I have set foot in a court, and the case was won um, a long time ago. If it's going to work, it's on. Maybe you can go to the next slide, because maybe the battery is... Oh, oh, we've gone right to the end. Thanks very much. Okay, so a number of years ago, back in the year 2000, there was a high-profile trial in South Africa involving the then president, Thabo Mbeki, the health minister, a consultant doctor, and a drug company. And the issue was one of a patient having died from a disease, but the family thought that he died because of a drug that had been given. And so there was a court case, and the president was on trial for allowing a drug to be licensed in the country, the health minister for the similar, allowing the drug, the drug company for producing a drug that was toxic, and the doctor for prescribing the drug. So it was a very complicated case. And I had to go to Johannesburg uh, a number of times as an expert witness for this case. But we were very fortunate to have a judge who was very sensible and very balanced and very wise. And the first day of the trial, he said he needed to get all the lawyers together to bang their heads together and to work this out so that it didn't have to go through this complicated trial. And they eventually did that. And I was very grateful. I thought I was going to end up on Robben Island or somewhere where um, Nelson Mandela had been for 27 years. Um, But it was a very wise judge. Now this morning we come to a trial involving a judge who you would not say 
was a wise judge. Pontius Pilate, we're really coming to a trial that lacked integrity, that lacked any degree of fairness, and it was really a mockery of a trial that we've had read to us this morning, and a travesty of justice. Now, according to one commentator, he says this, this was not just a bad piece of legal deliberation, but it was a scandalous and fraudulent betrayal of justice. Now, if you've been here in recent weeks, you will have known that Jesus had already been tried by a Jewish court. He'd gone before Caiaphas, the high priest, and you thought about this a couple of weeks ago. And the verdict at the end of chapter 26 and verse 65 was that he had uttered blasphemy. That was the charge brought by the Jewish authorities. And because of that, verse 66, they said that Jesus deserved to die. Now, these Jewish leaders could pronounce that, that G G uh, Jesus deserved to die, but they couldn't put that into practice. That had to go through the Roman authorities. They had no grounds, actually, to sentence Jesus to death. They had to go to the Roman governor. And so to the Roman governor, they take the Lord Jesus Christ, having at the end of chapter 26, it says they slapped him, they spat in his face, and they struck him. So we have to think that Jesus now appears before Pilate the governor, having been totally um, harangued, having been slapped, and having been spat on. It's scandalous. Now, Pilate has been governor since the year AD 26, and we're now in AD 33. He will remain governor until AD 36. It was generally regarded as the short straw to be the governor, the Roman governor, of that part of Israel. It was a long way from Rome, for one thing, and also the Jewish nation were regarded as being pretty difficult to manage. And therefore, to be the Roman governor of Israel was not the easiest call for someone to be sent to that region. And so here was Pontius Pilate. He's been there for a period of seven or eight years. He's got garrisons of soldiers in different parts of the nation, and there was one stationed in Jerusalem. And this was a particularly difficult time for Pilate. It was Passover. There were tens of thousands of pilgrims who'd come into the city. His primary responsibility was to keep people safe, to maintain law and order. And now here were these Jewish leaders bringing this trial, which he really didn't want to have to have anything to do with, and it comes before him, and he's got to try to sort out what is going to happen. And the account of what happens before Pilate is found in all four Gospels. And really, to get a full picture, you need to go to all four Gospels, because Matthew is one of the briefest of the reports of what happens before Pilate. So we have in mind, from John's Gospel, that Jesus is brought before Pilate by the Jewish authorities, but they refuse to go into the house of Pilate. He's a Gentile. And it says in John's Gospel that they didn't enter the governor's headquarters so that they would not be defiled and so they could eat the Passover. Just think about it. They wouldn't enter the court of a Gentile. They wouldn't enter into this Gentile's home because they wouldn't want to be defiled. Here were men who just defiled Jesus. They just spat at him. They'd just been striking him. And now they say they won't go into this home because they don't want to be defiled. Oh, no. We're the, we, we, we're the Pharisees. We're the Sanhedrin. We're the, we're the priests. Outside, they wanted to show that they were morally upright. And yet inside, they were stinking filthy with hypocrisy. And so Pilate has to go out to them outside his home 
and ask what the accusations against Christ were. And their reply, not in Matthew but elsewhere, is that if this man was not doing evil, we would not have brought him to you. Evil? This man does evil? This man who had healed people, who had spoken great words of kindness, who had raised people from the dead? Evil, that is the only word that they can bring. He's done evil. What twisted and contorted understanding of who Christ was. And Pilate, right from the outset, makes it clear that he doesn't think there's a case to answer. He wants nothing really to do with it. The fact that Jesus had acknowledged previously in the house of Caiaphas that he was the Son of God really didn't ring any bells as far as Pilate was concerned because Pilate would have thought of many gods. He was Roman after all. And now he is faced with this dilemma. So as we take up the narrative in chapter 27 of Matthew's Gospel, we're going to see initially three things. We're going to see number one, the charge which is brought against Jesus before Pilate. We see that in verses 11 to 14. Then we see the choice which confronts Pilate in verses 15 to 23. And then we see the compromise which Pilate makes in verses 24 to 26. The charge. Well, in any court, there has to be a charge made against a defendant. And the charge which they now bring is spelled out in more detail in Luke's account in chapter 23, when they say to Pilate, this man is misleading the nation. He is forbidding us to pay tribute or money to Caesar. And he's saying that he is Christ the king. Now, what they're trying to do is taking what they had previously said was just a religious charge, which was blasphemy, and now they're trying to exaggerate this and make it out that it's a political charge that they're bringing, that Jesus is an insurrectionist. He's trying to put himself against the authority of Rome. He's saying that he's a king. And their whole intent is to make out and make Pilate think that before him is a political agitator. And so Pilate asks a direct question. We see it here in verse 11. He says, are you, to Jesus, the king of the Jews? Now, John adds some more detail around that particular point because Jesus then said to Pilate, are you saying that because you've thought it up yourself? Or are other people saying that about me? My kingdom is not of this world, says Jesus. If it were, my servants would have been fighting. They wouldn't have let me be delivered over to you. So my kingdom is clearly not of this world. But the whole implication of Jesus' reply is that he was a king, but not in the sense that the accusers were saying. See, everything that the Jewish leaders were saying was distorted or fabricated. And Jesus' mission as to why he had come is clearly then portrayed and given to Pilate in John's account because Jesus says, for this purpose I was born. For this purpose I've come into the world to bear witness to the truth. At which Pilate says, what is truth? Now it's very difficult in one sense to know exactly the tone of what Pilate said. You can't see his expression, you can't see exact, exactly how he said it, but it seems to me when you read those words, what is truth? It's some sort of derogatory, sneering, cynical, skeptical comment by Pilate. <laughs> what is truth? And yet he's standing face to face with the one who is the truth. I am the way, the truth, 
and the life. But Pilate's not interested in getting to the truth. He just wants his whole affair to be over. There are more pressing things to do. And as you come back to Matthew's account, Pilate then tries to sort of wriggle away a little bit, and he says, well, there are other charges. He says there in verse 13, do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But Jesus is silent, just like he'd been silent before Caiaphas. He doesn't answer a single charge. And Pilate's amazed by that, because normally when a defendant comes before him, he sees people who are troublesome and aggressive. He sees people who are not serene and just standing there in silence like Jesus does. Isn't it interesting that you see that in chapter 26 before Caiaphas, Jesus silent. Now before Pilate, Jesus is silent. And we're coming face to face with a mystery. Because the mystery is coming to us from the Old Testament. As you read Isaiah 53, and we read that like a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. How can it be that what we're seeing with these wicked actions of men is actually fulfilling the prophecies of the Old Testament and fulfilling the plan and purposes of God? The charge. But then secondly, we see the choice in verses 15 to 23. Again, Matthew omits some of the details that we find elsewhere. For John tells us in his account that Pilate goes back out of the palace to the crowd. Remember, the crowd are outside. They won't go in. So Pilate has spoken to Jesus inside the palace. Now he goes out and he says to the crowd, I find no fault in him. No guilt. There is no guilt. Well, surely that seems final and sufficient. Here is the man who's got authority. He's saying, I find nothing in the charge. But rather than have the courage of his convictions, rather than making this final declaration, this man is not guilty, he says to the crowd, "Hmm. okay, well, you've got a custom. It's Passover time. And there's a custom that we release one prisoner, verse 15. And they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. Now in Pilate's mind, he, he's giving them the option. They're going to choose Christ, aren't they? They're bound to choose Christ. They don't want Barabbas. He's notorious. But of course, notorious can mean a couple of things, can't it? Notorious can mean someone who's really rotten through and through. But notorious can mean someone, yes, who's done a lot of wrong things. But actually, in people's minds, he's done some good things as well. Just think back over the last couple of weeks into the whole Israel-Gaza conflict. The death of the Hamas leader, Yaha Sinwar. He was notorious. He was responsible for October the 7th. He had sent fighters into Israel. What a notorious man he was. And yet notorious in the eyes of some in Gaza as being a revolutionary, a leader, someone who was fighting their cause and therefore they had time for him. And maybe there were those here who had time for Barabbas. And so they're shouting for Barabbas and not for Christ. And Pilate sees the mood of the crowd, and he's being swayed, just like the crowd is being swayed by the chief priests and the elders, urging them to cry for the release of Barabbas. So we find that Pilate is now saying that in his mind, I'm going to have to release Barabbas. But then there's an intervention because his wife comes on the scene. Do you notice as we read that? His wife has had a dream there in verse 19. She said, I've suffered much today from 
because of Jesus in a dream have nothing to do with this righteous man. Now, is Pilate going to take notice of his wife? <laughs> Most men have to. And therefore, he's now in this sort of dilemma. What's he going to do? She's saying, have nothing to do. He's going to get trouble when he goes home. But he's not a man of conviction. He's not a man who can stand up to what he believes. And he cries and pathetically says to the crowd in verse 23, what evil has Jesus done? But he's going to bow. He's going to be swayed. He's not going to stand up to what he believes. And therefore the pressure is going to be to release the son of a father, Barabbas, son of Abba's father, the son of a father, and not release the son of the father, the Lord Jesus Christ, the son of God, son of man. The charge, the choice is laid, and then the compromise we see in verses 24 to 26. Well, if ever a leader was swayed by a crowd to decide on something he didn't believe in, it's surely Pontius Pilate. We know that it's often said of politicians that they're not really conviction politicians, that they just get swayed by the crowd. Is that true of some of our politicians? Go back to 2022 when Keir Starmer said that there should be the right of gender self-identification, that a man could self-identify as a woman, that trans women were women. Oh, he made that statement very clearly. But then as the general election came a little bit closer and he could see votes seeping away a little bit, he went back on what he'd said in 2022, at least to some extent, changing his tone talking about women's rights and protection of women. What is a woman? Seems simple. What's a working man? That's been the issue this week. Can't even define what a working person is. And so often politicians get swayed. Convictions? Where are the convictions? And here is Pilate. Here's a man who's got authority. He's got power. He can do exactly what is right. Previously, we're told, actually, in Luke's Gospel, chapter 13, that he displayed absolute ruthlessness on an occasion when some pilgrims had come into Jerusalem from Galilee, and they'd been busily offering sacrifices in the temple, and Pilate had all of those people killed. And we're told in Luke 13 that their blood mingled with the sacrifices. He was ruthless. He had authority. And yet here, he just gives in, swayed by the crowd. And what does he do? Verse 24, he takes water and washes his hands. Where the phrase comes from, I'll wash my hands of you. It's exactly what Jesus is doing. He washes what Pilate is doing. He's washing his hands of the Lord Jesus Christ. Effectively, he's saying, I don't want anything more to do with this. I bear no responsibility for what's happening. We're told elsewhere that he sends Jesus to try and get out of this. He sends Jesus to the north part of the country, to Herod Antipas. He was the ruler of the north part in Galilee. Herod doesn't want anything to do with it, so he sends him back to Jerusalem. And then it's the crowd. It's over to you. Verse 25. And all the people answered, His blood be on us and on our children. Then he released for them Barabbas. Pilate was at the end of the road, his compromise was complete. His convictions had gone out of the window. For him, this was 
dealt with. Can we not see this passage speaking to us in some ways? Just look back over this past week or weeks. Have there been any situations where you or I have found myself to compromise what we believe we know is right? We say we've got convictions, and yet we've been swayed. Swayed by the crowd, peer pressure. Swayed by social media pressure. Swayed by things that just come in, and our convictions have seemed to just drift away, and compromise has been so easy. I don't believe it matters whether you're 75 or 15. It's easy for all of us to compromise. It's so easy. And the Bible, in a sense, is a mirror. We're looking into it this morning. And I'm seeing myself. Are you seeing yourself to some extent? There have been those times when we have, we have caved in, we've, we, we've, we've gone with the crowd when we know we shouldn't have done. We're convictions which we hold, and yet the compromise has been so easy. Well, this passage asks us to heed the warning, to hold our convictions, to not compromise, to not wash our hands of what we know is true. The charge, the choice, the compromise, and then finally, the creed. We say, I don't see that here. No, it isn't. But the creed is something which many of you will have known and have said in the past. It's a statement of faith of the Christian church, which expresses essential biblical doctrines that have been articulated and defended through the ages. Credo, creed, I believe. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the one true church the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Who's mentioned in the creed? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Mary and Pontius Pilate. Well, I think we can understand maybe why Mary is mentioned. Well, she's associated with Jesus' birth. She carried the, the Christ child in the womb. But Pilate, why not Saul of Tarsus? Why not John the Baptist? Why not Peter? Why Pilate? Only two people mentioned in the whole of the creed. This is what we believe. We believe that he suffered under Pontius Pilate. Well, surely Pilate is here to show to us that the message of the book that we hold in our hands is a book which is true truth. Pilate said, what is truth? What we have in our hands is truth. God's truth. About the one who is the truth and the life. And the very fact that we mention Pontius Pilate in the creed shows to us that we have a salvation history, which is real history. It is verifiable. The existence of Pontius Pilate can be verified outside of the Bible. He was someone who lived in this stone, which was found in 1961 in a place called Caesarea Maritime, which is on the coast shows to us inscription about Pontius Pilate from the first century. And archaeologists said that many of them said Pontius Pilate had never lived. And yet here is found the evidence 
of Pontius Pilate living in the first century in that region, in that area, and was governor of Judea. You see, the Bible, no one can come to the Bible and say it's not true. This is the word of God. And so when the Bible describes the events of Jesus' life, it sets these events in actual history. You, if you're this morning saying, well, I'm not sure if I can believe, you're flying in the face of all the evidence. The evidence that this book is God's book. Don't fly in the face of the evidence. And Pilate was an integral part of the history of Jesus, mentioned in all four Gospels, and we can absolutely trust this book. And as we considered him this morning, the one who suffered under Pontius Pilate, so we see the amazing love of God for sinners. That it was his love for me that nailed him to the tree to die in agony for all my sin. And we say, here is love vast as the ocean, loving kindness as the flood, when the Prince of Life, our ransom, shed for us his precious blood. And it's now asking, what is our response? What's it going to be this week? Is it going to be compromise to easily give in to popular opinion? Or is it to be conviction? And the conviction that love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, and my all. Conviction or compromise, you respond.